Hi, I'm Pastor Don Cherry of the Shenandoah Valley Baptist Church in Stephen City, Virginia. And we're glad that you've chosen to join us this morning for our worship service. We're hoping that it'll be a blessing to you, be an encouragement to you, and even a little bit of a challenge to you as we look into the Word of God together. So I hope that you'll follow us, have your Bible out, and all join in with us and join us as we go into the Word of God this morning. May it be a blessing to you. Well, thank you much. It's a blessing to be here. And, uh, you know, I've heard about this church since I was a little kid. Because I think Donnie Cant Cantwell was here for a while. And then Mike and Mark Grooms came up and, and were a part of this uh, journey up here. How many of you were here when either Donnie was here or Mike or Mark were here? Anybody at all? Yeah, a bunch of you guys. That's awesome. Well, those guys are all great guys. Mark is a pastor in Lynchburg right now at Thomas Terrace Baptist Church, which is just down the road from... Uh, from Thomas Road, about 10 minutes down the road, and we do a lot of work together. And then Mike Rooms is a pastor who's about to retire. He's over in Roanoke uh, at the church there, and he's about to retire and kind of take it easy. And uh, so he's, uh, he might come back up here and hang out with you guys a little bit. Who knows? But he's a, he's a great one. And, of course, their dad, J.O. Grooms, who was, uh, worked alongside of my dad for many, many years, such a blessing to not only to our church but to people literally all over the country. I heard... Uh, you guys talking a little bit ago, someone back here was talking about the, uh, the treasure path to soul winning, which was something that, uh, that J.O. Grooms wrote, uh, a Bible memorization program, and uh, man, what a blessing he was, and he had one track mind, and that was to get people saved. That's all he cared about, that's all he wanted to do. In fact, he was so committed to getting people saved that he would forget about things that were like common sense. I remember one time he flew to Dallas, Texas. And um, he, uh, well, no, I'm sorry, he drove to Dallas, Texas to speak at a conference there at a church. He drove all the way to Dallas and got there and was uh, preaching there for a, like a week, a long crusade or something like that. He got done and uh, he flew back home. He forgot his car and left it in Dallas because all he was thinking about was doing what he was supposed to do. And so someone actually had to go back and get his car. But uh, Great, great family, great to be here, great to be with these guys over here. So uh, Josh, that was leading right here in the middle, uh, he actually leads at Thomas Road sometimes. With, uh, Scott Billman and Charles Billingsley serves uh, on our worship team there occasionally. He's a student at Liberty, also uh, the worship leader at our youth camp, which is up in the Blue Ridge Mountains, up near uh, the Peaks of Otter there, about 45 minutes or so, I guess, outside of Lynchburg, and he's our worship leader uh, up there as well. And so it's great to be with all these young people and Man, they're so talented, and you know they are, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, six of 15,200 students at Liberty University this fall who are passionate about the gospel and passionate about being champions for Christ, and that, by the way, is what birthed this church, because my dad had a passion for changing the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ, and he just simply believed that the only way to pull that off was to actually take Jesus at his word. And you know what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18? He said these words, that I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. That was his passion. That's his heart. And that's what he wants our passion and our heart to be. And so uh, my dad, along with many others, were passionate about planting churches uh, all across the country. And I had a privilege of speaking just uh, about three weeks ago down in the Richmond area at another church that my dad uh, helped start. And uh, not long ago, I was over in Virginia Beach and preached over there in a, in a church that my dad helped start. And then uh, about a year ago, I had the privilege of going up to Arnold's Valley, Virginia. And it's near Natural Bridge, which you probably have heard of Natural Bridge. It's out in the middle of nowhere. In fact, you go to nowhere and take a left and drive about five miles out in Arnold's Valley. And that was the very first church that my dad started, planted after Thomas Road. He planted Thomas Road in 1956 and 1957. He planted this little church out in Arnold's Valley. And it's still there and still meeting and still preaching the gospel. Uh, because, you know, as Chuck Swindoll often says, when God's, work, God, when God's man dies, God's work never does. And so that's what we must recognize. It's not about us. It's about the gospel of Jesus Christ, which will carry on regardless of whether we are here or not. However... While we are here, we have a responsibility. You heard Josh read from Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. Man, we've got a job to do. And that job is not something that was, you know, came up with at you know, some seminary. There was not some professor who sat down and figured out what our mission statement ought to be. Our mission statement comes from Christ and Christ alone. 
because when you go to Matthew chapter 28, when you go to Mark chapter 16, when you go to Acts chapter 1, in all of those passages, what you read is Jesus speaking in one conversation recorded in three different places in Scripture right before he was about ascending into heaven. And he said these words, go into all the world, preach the gospel, make disciples of all the nations, go to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. And so he gave us our marching orders many years ago. He made it clear what our responsibility is. And our responsibility is to tell the gospel to people wherever we might be and to be passionate about it. And so we're here tonight. Man, it's exciting to be able to be here for a few minutes and, uh, and open God's word with you uh, to help remind you, but also to help remind me that what we are to do is to be representatives of the, representatives of the gospel of Jesus Christ wherever we might go. And it doesn't matter whether we're sitting in a church or we're sitting in a Walmart or whether we're sitting in a McDonald's parking lot, we have a responsibility and a duty to be representatives of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That does not change and it does not stop no matter how young or how old or whether you are just starting in the workforce or whether you are retired, wherever you are in the context of your life, we have a duty and we have a responsibility and we better be about the work, the business of the kingdom of God. And so I want you to turn in your Bibles tonight. Uh, Josh got us kicked off in Ephesians chapter 4. And so what I'm going to do is have you roll back to Ephesians chapter 1. And we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 1 tonight, and Ephesians chapter 2 tonight, and Ephesians chapter 3 tonight. And I'll stop there since he was in Ephesians chapter 4, and we'll save chapters 5 and 6 for maybe the next time I come. How's that, Don? Uh, and so Ephesians chapter 1, 2, and 3, we're going to talk about uh, what it is that Paul wants us to understand about our responsibility uh, in the kingdom of God. Now, to give you a little context of the book of Ephesians, it was written in 61 AD. It was a book, the letter that was written while Paul was sitting in jail. Uh, I don't know about you, but if I were sitting in jail, I don't think I would be sitting there trying to figure out how to write a book. I would be sitting there trying to figure out how to get out of the place. But he was interested about writing this letter to a church that he also had helped plant. You go all the way back into the 40s and the 50s AD, not long after Jesus was crucified, not long after he rose again, not long after he ascended into heaven. And Paul began preaching and teaching. We had the first missionary journey, the second missionary journey. Uh, towards the end of the second missionary journey, he found himself in the city of Ephesus, a city of about 350,000 people, a powerful city at that time, a large city at that time. And he found himself there and he saw what was happening there. He saw the importance of that city, but he also saw the sin in that city. He saw the, the uh, decadence that was going on in that city. He saw how everything was out of control in that city. And so he planted a church. And that church he planted was not one that he planted and then he took off and headed off to the next stop. In fact, when Paul started and planted that church in Ephesus, he stayed there for three years. You've been here three and a half. And so for as long as you've been here, that's about the time that Paul spent at the church at Ephesus. Man, he stayed there. You know what he did? He planted the church. He nurtured the church. He grew the church. He knocked on doors. He visited the hospital. They probably had potluck dinners back then. I don't know if they didn't have pork, I that's for sure. But whatever they did back in those days, he stayed there for three years growing that church. And then he found himself, not long after that, again in 61 AD, he found himself in prison in Rome. He was in house arrest there, not knowing if he'd ever make it back or whether ever he would you know, make it back to visit that church that he loved so much. And so he wrote a letter. And that letter, this letter, the letter to the Ephesians, the church at Ephesus, is that letter that he wrote. And he wrote this letter to give them a picture of what it really means to be the church of Jesus Christ. Now, what I just shared with you is the reason that Paul wrote this letter to the church at Ephesus. But what I would also underscore at this moment is it's also why this book is so important to you and me. Because let me kind of draw some parallels if we could. So here we are in the church of Jesus Christ in 2021. And guess what's going on in our world? Decadence. The world's gone mad. The world's gone crazy. The world is out of control. And it doesn't matter whether you're looking at Washington or Afghanistan or Haiti or New York or, or wherever it might be. This world has gone mad. It is completely out of control. And in the midst of a world that has gone completely out of control, we have to recognize our responsibility and our duty that we must be the church that will bring light into darkness. Now, do you agree with me that the world tonight is in darkness? I hope you do, because it is. 
And we're constantly looking for the answers. We're looking for hope. We're looking for something that will get us out of this mess that we are in. And we are in a mess. And here's what I know. That mess will never be solved by who's sitting in the White House. It'll never be solved by who's sitting in the Capitol. It'll never be solved who's sitting in the governor's mansion. It'll never be solved when in the Supreme Court. It'll be solved when the church of Jesus Christ decides to stand up, to be counted, to preach truth, to represent Christ, and to be light in this world like we are called to be. Because what we have gotten ourselves into, the situation that we've allowed ourselves to to be lulled into, is this, is that today the church is more influenced by the culture than the culture influenced by the church. And that's where we are in today's world. And so we go to Ephesians chapter 1, and in verses 1 and 2, Paul gives his standard greeting to the church, the standard statement when he talks about who he is and and what his job is, what his responsibility is. He talks about who he's writing this letter to. He's writing to the saints. And I think as I look across this room tonight, what I recognize is I'm talking to a group of saints in this room. And that's who we are. We are blood-bought, redeemed sinners who have been saved by the grace of God and nothing else, right? We'll get to that in a few minutes. Like, Like, that's who we are. We're nothing more than sinners. Romans chapter 3, that we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That means you and that means me. We've all sinned and we've blown it. We've fallen short. We're human and we've blown it. Say it with me. We're human and we've blown it. One more time because you didn't do that very well. Why? Because you blew it. Let's try it one more time. We are human and we've blown it, right? That's who we are. Now, in recognition of that, in the picture of what that looks like, Paul is writing this letter to the saints that are at Ephesus to remind them of what's really important. And the book of Ephesians, this letter to the church at Ephesus, is really kind of a, an all-encompassing book, a picture of everything that you need to know about being in the body of Christ. In fact, you could actually take this letter, this book, out of the Bible, out of God's Word, put a new wrapping around it, and sell it at the airport, and you could call it the Christian life for dummies. You could put the yellow and black cover on there, sell it, I mean, you'd sell it all day long, because everything that you need to know is found within this book. The first three chapters talks about what we believe. The second three chapters, the last three chapters, talks about how we must behave. And so the first three, hey, here's what you need to know. Here's what you've got to hang your hat on. Here's what you've got to stand on, what you've got to run in, what you've got to believe in. And then the last three, hey, and here's what you need to do with it. Here's the response to what you just learned. And so I would encourage you, like, spend some time reading this book. But tonight, I'm just going to point out a couple of different verses in the first three chapters. And those statements about what we need to believe. And so, again, verses 1 and 2, the greeting, you know, from Paul the Apostle. And he's writing to the saints, the church at Ephesus. And listen to what he says in verse 3. This is an important statement. He said, Blessed is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavens in Christ. 4, verse 4, For he chose us in him before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless in love before him. Now think about that passage I just read. Two simple verses. Two simple statements. He talked about how that God is blessed as the Father of of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But then he said these words. That same God who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Not with some of the spiritual blessings. Not with a few of the spiritual blessings. We have been blessed with every spiritual blessing. Meaning that God has not held anything back. And aren't you grateful for that? Because remember, we're human and we've blown it, right? All of us. And so knowing that God has promised to give to us every spiritual blessing, man, what a great gift that God gives. Now, the reason that Paul spent the first couple of verses to make sure that they understood that is because, again, they were up against a culture that was pressing in against the church, trying to get them to stop believing what they had been taught, to get them to run away from what they had been, te- been, been taught at the church. They wanted them to, the culture wanted them to, to run away from this idea that Jesus was the only way to heaven. Like the, the pressure, what was intense. And by the way, again, let's draw some parallels. The same thing is true today. And make no mistake, the pressure that we feel today is nothing like we're going to feel in the days to come. Where the government and the culture is constantly going to be telling us that what we believe 
This idea of the Bible being God's word, this idea of Jesus being the only way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father except through Him. Make no mistake, the world is constantly going to be pushing in harder and harder, harder and further and further to get us to run away from that core belief. And if you don't believe they're going to continue to try to force us away from that truth, then you are sadly mistaken. And you cannot take my word for it. I'm just, again, I'm human and I've blown it. But here's who you can take the word for. You can take God's word for it. Because if you go over into the book of 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy, what you read there is, again, Paul writing says this, oh, in the last days, it's going to get bad. It's going to get really bad. And it's going to be worse than you can even possibly imagine. That's where we're headed. God promises the days ahead are not going to be easy. But let me remind you, What the Apostle Paul said, we have been blessed with every spiritual blessing. In other words, God is not going to hold anything back from those who are the saints, those who are called according to the purpose of God. That's good news because we're going to need it. We're going to need those spiritual blessings. And so then Paul goes on to write in verse 4. It says, for you have been chosen. Think about that. That God chose us for this moment. That regardless of who you are, regardless of what you do, whether you're a pastor like Don and I are, or whether you are a business person, a lay person, whether you are a college student, God has chosen us. And not only has He chosen us, it says that He has chosen us before the foundation of the world. Before the world was even spoken into existence, God had a plan for you and me. Before anything was created, before the sun, the moon, the stars were hanging in the sky, before the fish were swimming in the sea, before the animals were were walking around the earth, before there was an Adam and before there was an Eve, before there was a Garden of Eden, God had you and me on His mind. He has chosen us before the foundation of the world. That's awesome, but it's also humbling, isn't it? Because what that tells us is that God had a plan for you and me that goes all the way back before Adam and Eve chose to to take that fruit off of that tree that was forbidden and sin entered into the world. And because sin entered the world, death entered into the world. Before that even happened, God was thinking about you and me and he had a plan. What was his plan? Keep reading in verse 4. It says, for he has chosen us before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless. Now there we find a pretty important statement. Now, if you're reading that passage, what you normally would do, like what I've done many times as I was growing up, when I read that passage, you get to that statement, holy and blameless, and you kind of read them together like it's the same idea. You know, you kind of like talking about a, you know, a beautiful tree that's out in the yard. You say, oh, it's tall and green. That's not what this passage is all about. It's not the same thought. It's not, has nothing to do with one another. Because what this talking about here, that you've been chosen before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless, there are two different thoughts, and those two different thoughts are actually the responsibility of two different people. Now think about that for a moment, that we've been called, chosen, before the foundation of the world to be holy. That's our responsibility. So God had a plan for us, but that plan requires you and me as followers of Christ to pursue holiness. The Bible says, God speaking, I am holy, therefore you must be holy. That we have a responsibility to put the the principles of God's word into practice in everyday life. That is our burden. That's our responsibility. Something God has placed onto us. But the second statement is not our responsibility. So we are to be holy. That's our job. But we are also to be blameless. That's God's job. And here's the reason it's God's job. Because there's nothing that we could ever do to be blameless before God. Blameless means without fault. Blameless means redeemed. Blameless means that there's nothing about us that is unworthy to be in the presence of God. And in case you've not been paying attention to God's word, in case you've not been paying attention to the preaching that Don has done here at this church, here's what I want all of you to know. Just a quick news flash. There is nothing that you and I can ever do to earn the right to be called children of God. And so we are to pursue holiness, absolutely. But to stand blameless before him, that's God's job. And God fulfilled that job by allowing His Son Jesus to come to this earth and to die on the cross for our sins, to be buried, to pay for our sin debt, and then three days later to rise again. And because He did that, we have the privilege, the opportunity, the unbelievable gift. It does not make sense that we can stand blameless before Him. Pretty cool, huh? Holy, our job. Blameless, God's job. Now, when we recognize that truth, when we recognize that statement, 
Paul wanted to make sure that the church at Ephesus understood, like, so yeah, the world's gone mad. It's going to get tough. Oh, but be encouraged. Be encouraged because God's given you every spiritual blessing. Be encouraged because God chose you before he created anything. Be encouraged because as you pursue holiness, as you run after the word of God, God has already given you the opportunity to be blameless before him, that you've been redeemed and blood-bought before him. Man, be encouraged. If we were to continue reading in Ephesians chapter 1, some other statements that you would see in there, some statements that you would read would be about something like the fact that, that, that God uh, raised Jesus from the dead and the same power that he used to raise Jesus from the dead is the same power that he gives us the power to walk in, to stand in, and that Jesus, who is at the right hand of the Father today, that Jesus is there, and it says that everything in this world has been given to it under the authority of Jesus Christ. That same one that the Bible says is sitting at the right hand of the Father making intercession for you and me. The way we would say that is this, is that Jesus today is in heaven in the presence of God and he has our back. I don't know about you, but that's good news too. Because man, our world's messed up. We've talked about that. It's out of control. Yep, we're out of control because we're human and because we've blown it. When you walk out of here tonight, I know you're going to remember two things about my sermon. You are human, and you've blown it. And because of that, to think that everything in this world, no matter how bad it is, is in the authority and the power and the hand of Jesus Christ, and that there's nothing that Satan can do to stop him. There's nothing that Satan do, can do to keep him from doing what he has promised that he would do, that there's nothing that Satan can do to kill the church, that Jesus himself said that he would build, and the gates of hell itself will not prevail against it. I don't know about you, but that's an encouraging word. And so Paul wanted to make sure the church at Ephesus understood that because he knew what the church at Ephesus was going to face. And the Holy Spirit of God that breathed these words into the heart of Paul also knew what we were going to face. 2,000 years later, as we sit in 2021, at a time when our culture has gone mad, our country has gone mad, our politicians, boy, they've all been mad. Republican, Democrat, it doesn't matter. Just trust me, they're all nuts. They're all gone crazy. And in the midst of all of that, what we see and what we understand is this. Jesus is still in control. He is still on his throne. The word of God has not been negated. It has not been tossed aside. And it is still truth. So we've got to understand that. So Paul wanted to make sure that we had that picture. And so that's what Ephesians chapter 1 is all about. Ephesians chapter 2. Go to Ephesians chapter 2 in the very first verse. Paul again wants to make sure that they understand wanted to make sure this church at Ephesus that he loved so dearly, that he spent so much time with, to understand why it is that they can be encouraged. Listen to the very first words in chapter 2. It says, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you previously lived according to the ways of this world, according to the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit now working in the disobedient. We too all previously lived among them in our fleshly desires, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and our thoughts. And while we were by nature children under wrath, as the others were also. And so what he's telling them is, hey guys, in case you've forgotten, you're all human. And you all blew it, is what he's saying. That we were once dead because of our sin. That we were once hopeless because of our sin. We were once in a situation where we had nowhere to go and nowhere to turn and we had no future and, and nothing to be joyful about, nothing to be happy about, nothing to be encouraged about because life was bad, life was falling apart. We were dead in our sin. But Paul's not done. Next verse, verse 4. Two words. You ought to underline your Bible. But God. I love that. Next time your life is falling apart, next time things are going really bad, next time you get a bad phone call and you don't know what to do, the next time your family is driving you crazy, which that happens too, the next time you're sitting there at a stoplight and somebody cuts you off and you're mad and you want to do something about it, and man, you just get in the flesh, remember this, I was once dead, but God, but God. Anytime you hear that phrase, that statement in God's word, it means something really good is about to happen. So we were dead in our sins, but God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love that he had for us, made us alive with Christ, even though we were dead in trespasses. You are saved by grace. Good news. You're not saved by being good. 
You're not saved by showing up at church. You're not saved by serving in the nursery. And I thank God that's true because I can't stand changing diapers. You're not saved by being a good person. You're not saved by being moral. You're not saved by carrying your Bible into church. You're not saved by singing in the choir. You're not saved by serving on the mission field. You're not saved by bringing in supplies that are going to go to Appalachia. You are not saved by anything that you do. You are saved by grace. By believing that Jesus is God's son, that he died, that he was buried, and that he rose again. And by having that understanding, by grabbing a hold of that truth, that we who were once dead, God has made alive. Man, I'm so grateful for that. Because I know me really well. And what I know about me is I'm human. And I've blown it a bunch of times. What I know about me is I'm human and I blew it yesterday. And I'm going to blow it probably tomorrow. Man, I just keep messing up because my human side keeps getting in front, you know, kind of getting in the way of my Christian side. Anybody know that story? Raise your hand. Those of you who did not raise your hand, it just happened to you because you lied in church. It happens to all of us. We're all in that boat. We're all in that situation where our human side is constantly in conflict with our Christian side. And because of that, if we believe that we had to work our way to heaven, if we believe that it was our salvation was based on what we do and not what Christ has already done, then what ends up happening is we would be really discouraged. And man, we would be running in circles, kind of like a hamster on a hamster wheel, man, constantly running and running and running and not going anywhere because we cannot work our way to heaven. That we will never be good enough, that we will never be spiritual enough, that we will never be godly enough, that we will never do everything right enough. But God, that even though we were dead in our sins, has made us alive. You are saved by grace. Now, of course, you kept reading. You'd get down to verses 8 and 9, and you know what that says, right? That we are saved by faith, not of works, lest any man should boast, right? So we can't get up and talk about how good we are. We can't get up and think, you know, let the world see, like, we're just a wonderful person, you know? We can't do that. Well, you can, but it doesn't do you any good. In fact, what that does is it makes sure that everybody around you knows that you're not good because you're lying. Because it's not about what we do, and it's not about how good we are. It's all about who God is, and it's all about what God has done. We have been saved by faith, by believing in Jesus. Romans chapter 10 if you believe in your heart, confess with your lips that Jesus Christ is Lord, that he was raised from the dead. Verse 13, anyone, anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. It all comes from Christ. It all comes to the power of what Jesus did. And so Paul wanted to make sure the church understood that because here's what he knew was going to happen at the church at Ephesus. He knew they were going to fail. He knew they were going to have moments where they backslid. He knew they were going to have moments where they would fall back into their old ways. And here's what he did not want them to do. He did not want them to fall back into their old ways for a time, for a season, for a moment, and then feel like I've blown it too badly, and therefore I'm going to give up, and I'm just going to live like the world. I think all of us in this room probably know some Christians like that. I know that I do. As a pastor, I know a lot of people like that that have, have come into the church and man, they've gotten saved and they're excited and they're passionate and then they mess up and they feel like they messed up too much for God to care about them anymore and then you stop seeing them at church anymore and they kind of disappear and they go right back into their old lifestyle. Why? Because they think that they are not good enough for God. Newsflash for all of us, none of us are good enough for God. None of us are good enough for God. But God made us alive again even though we were dead in our sins. Man, that's good news. And so he wanted to make sure they understood that. And then after he says, oh, and by the way, you know, you're saved by faith. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. He goes right into Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. And you know what that, word, that verse says? Now, we all know verses 8 and 9. Like, that's the famous ones. Like, we all have our, we all have our John 3, 16s down. We've all got those verses down, right? But Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, that next verse says this, for we are God's masterpiece created anew in Christ Jesus to do the works that he prepared for us beforehand. And that goes right back to what we talked about a moment ago from Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4 
In Ephesians chapter 1, I mean, chapter 1, verse 4, where it says that before the foundations of the world, God chose us, right, to be holy and blameless. Here in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, it says this, that we are God's masterpiece created anew in Christ Jesus to do the works that He has prepared for us beforehand, before time began. And here's what that means. Before the world began, God had a job for you to do. God had you specifically in mind to do something for Him. Because we're all gifted. You go to Ephesians chapter 4, you'll find it talks about spiritual gifts. That God has equipped each and every one of us to do great and mighty things. Like we heard this great band a few moments ago. And they're all talented, man. I was sitting there watching them all play and sing. They're all talented. And here's what I know. If they invited me to come up and do a song with them, (laughs) it would stink. Because I can't play any instrument, I, I can't sing, I, I mean, my family, they're all musical, they all sing, but if I got up, it would be like a disaster, because I can't do that, I'm not gifted in that way. But they are, and here's what they're doing, they're using their talents that God has given to them to further the kingdom of God. Well, here's a newsflash for all of you as well, you have been gifted by God. That you've been given a unique gift, a unique talent to be used by God. And it comes in lots of different fashions. Here's what you got to do. If you don't know what it is, figure it out. Like figure it out pretty soon because we've got a work to do. Not because you're old. I'm just, yeah, we got work to do, right? We've got a job to do. Why? Because we are God's masterpiece. God created us exactly the way that we are. He did not make a mistake when He created us. And when He created us as His masterpiece, He created us with a job to do that He had in mind before the world began. That's why it's so important that we're involved in serving and going and missions. Don was sharing with me before the service how you guys have been talking about the importance of like Uh, of doing mission work and of serving. It's why you're collecting items like these over here. It's why you took up an offering not long ago for some missions work. It's why you're doing those kinds of things because God has called us to make a dent in the universe in which we live, to do something big while we can because time is short. We're not promised tomorrow. Remember a few moments ago when I talked to you about how in the last days it says that things will get worse and worse. Remember that? Yeah, I don't know if you've been paying attention, but things are getting worse and worse. I mean, I have no idea. I, you know, listen, I'm not the kind of guy that like, says you know, that Jesus is going to return like on you know, September the 18th at 2 p.m. in the afternoon. Like, I'm not that guy. I can't, you know, I'm not one of those guys. No one knows the day. No one knows, knows the hour. In fact, I remember back when I was six years old, uh, there was this preacher, Jack Van Empey. How many of you remember Jack Van Empey? A lot of you guys, yeah. So Jack Van Empey, great guy. I, I mean, dear friend of my dad's, and, and, and I had the privilege of, of meeting him a number of times. But I remember that back uh, when I was about six years old, Jack Van Empey, in the summer of that year, that he made a declaration that God had told him that Jesus was going to return in, on September the 5th of that year. And I was ticked off because my birthday was September 7th. And I was so mad because I'd already picked out everything I wanted for my birthday. And I was mad. I was angry. I was like, Jesus can't do that. Hey, good news. He didn't. But here's what I know. I'm 55 years now, old now. So it's 49 years ago that took place. I'm 55 years older. And here's what I know. It was bad then. It is really bad now. It's getting worse and worse. It talks about how there'll be wars and rumors of war. Paying attention? It talks how there'll be natural disasters. Paying attention? It talks about how there'll be pestilences. You know what pestilence is? Hey, COVID. It's getting worse and worse. I have no idea when Jesus is going to return, but here's what I'm telling you. If he doesn't return sometime soon, I'd hate to see what the future holds because it's pretty bad out there. And so we got work to do because time is short. And so Paul wanted to make sure they understand, like, while you're there in Ephesus, while you're doing what you're doing there, hey, I know it's, like, really tough there, and I know, you know, the the culture is leaning in on you and pushing in on you, but listen, you've got a job to do, and you've got a job to do that God prepared for you, and it's not about how good you are, it's about how good God is because of what he's done through his gift, the gift of his son, Jesus Christ. So, So, like, understand, you are God's masterpiece created to do the works that God has prepared for you. And then Paul wanted to make sure they understood as he was writing this letter. Because they're sitting there and they get in this letter from the Apostle Paul. Which, by the way, in case, you know, back in those days, like the Apostle Paul was kind of like, you know, like Billy Graham on steroids. Right? I mean, like the Apostle Paul was like a big deal. 
you know, and so Paul wanted them to know, like, yes, Paul's the one that wrote this letter, and yes, he was an apostle, and yes, you know, he, you know, God appeared to him, and yes, he saw Jesus in his resurrected body, and, you know, all of those things, which, which are so incredible and so awesome, but flip over to Ephesians chapter 3 in verses 7 and 8. Because in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 7 and 8, listen to what Paul writes here. Because again, he wants them to understand like why this is important. He says this, I was made a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace that was given to me by the working of His power. In other words, what Paul's saying is this. It's like, hey, it's not because I'm a good guy. It's not because I'm a good preacher. It's not because I'm powerful. It's not because I'm well-known. It's not because I've got a big platform. It's not because people follow me. It's not because I've had the opportunity of seeing Jesus face to face. That's not why I'm able to do what I'm doing. I, he says, was made a servant, a doulos, a slave, really is what he's saying, of this gospel by the gift of God's grace. In other words, it's not by what I did. It's but what Jesus did. And then listen to verse 8. This grace was given to me, the least of all the saints, to proclaim to the Gentiles the incalculable riches of Christ. That verse is a verse in my Bible that's like underlined. It's a big deal to me. Because what the Apostle Paul is saying to that church, what he's saying to this church, what he's saying to me, basically he's saying even though I'm the worst of the worst, even though I've blown it a thousand times, even though I'm human and I've blown it, God has given me the privilege of sharing the gospel. The worst of the worst. Now here's why that's an important passage. Because churches today in America are full of Christians, followers of Christ, people who've been saved by the grace of God, people who were once dead who've been made alive, who never share the gospel because they feel like they're not worthy. Because they feel like they don't know what to say. Because they wonder what people will think of them. Because they're worried about whether they might get laughed at. They're worried if they might stumble over their words. And the Apostle Paul knew that. He knew it for that church. He knew it for this church. Because he knew that everyone he was writing this letter to was human. And they'd blown it. And so Paul wanted them to understand. Guys, I'm the worst. I'm a really bad guy. Go back in the book of Acts and you'll find out how bad he was. Acts chapter 7. You know what it says about the Apostle Paul? It says he was wreaking havoc on the church. Wreaking havoc on the church. Now when I was a kid, I wreaked havoc on the church. But Paul did it in a far greater way. Because if you go to Ephesians chapter 8, the first verse, it says this, is that he was actually a murderer. That he was killing people because of their faith in Christ. So he was wreaking havoc on the church. He was killing people because they believed in Christ. And so he's saying, listen, man, I was the worst of the worst. Man, I blew it time and time and time again. And Acts chapter 7 and Acts chapter 8 like bears that out. When, when Stephen was killed, he was there. And the Bible says that he approved of everything that they did. When they stoned Stephen for standing up for Christ, Paul was standing in the corner with a smile on his face saying, go get him, guys. The church at Ephesus knew that. And so he said, listen, guys, I'm the worst of the worst. But for some reason, and I don't get it, and I don't understand it, it does not make sense. For some reason, God has given me this great gift to reveal the incalculable riches of the gospel of Jesus Christ to a world that desperately needs it. Now, if the Apostle Paul can say it, so can we. There's not a person in this room who's as bad of a person as the Apostle Paul was. There's not a person in this room, I hope, that has killed someone for following Christ. I hope there's not a person in this room that's killed anybody, period. But regardless, there's not a person in this room that wreaked havoc on the church the way the Apostle Paul did. He was the worst of the worst in his own admission. And yet God chose him and used him. And if God could use him, do you think maybe God could use us? The answer to that question, by the way, is absolutely. 
We have a job to do. And we'll end tonight where we started tonight with where Josh started us this evening out of Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, I, a prisoner in the Lord, urge you to live worthy of the calling that you have received. Live worthy. Run after Christ. Serve Him. Tell others about Him. And together, let's be a part of changing this world through the gospel of Jesus Christ. As a part of this church that Jesus said, I will build and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. You know what that basically means? As long as we're walking in the will of God, within the house of God, serving within the church of God, here's one thing you got to know. We will not fail. That's good news. Satan can't stop us. The world will not defeat us. The government will not shut us down. The enemy will not be able to keep us from doing what God has called us to do. Why? Because Jesus didn't say, they will build my church. He said, I will build my church. That's an organization I want to be a part of. And I pray that's the organization that you want to be a part of as an active participant and taking the gospel to the world. Live worthy of the calling of God on your life because God has called us to do something big. And together, if we're faithful, if we're passionate, we will do it and we will see the world turned upside down. That's my prayer and I hope it's yours. Can we pray together? Father, thank you for the way that your word speaks to us. Because, God, we need to be corrected. We are human, and we blow it over and over again. But, Father, we thank you that in the midst of all of that, in the midst of our mistakes, in the midst of our failings, in the midst of our shortcomings, God, that you are always faithful to say that if we confess our sins, that you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God, we thank you for that great gift that 1 John 1, 9 teaches. And so, Lord, I pray for every person gathered in this room, whether young or old, whether male or female, regardless of where they are in life, what position they might be in, God, I pray that you would use each and every one of us to do the work that you called us to do and to do it with heart and to do it with passion, to reflect the love of Christ, to bring light to darkness. And Lord, because of our willingness to be used by you, God, that we can simply say, God, here we are, use us, and that we will see your hand use us to change the world. And God, for that, we'll give you the praise, we'll give you the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks for letting me be with you guys tonight. Don? Well, folks, thanks for joining us in our live stream here from Shenandoah Valley Baptist Church in Stephen City, Virginia. And I trust that the message was an encouragement to your heart today. If you'd like to find out more about that ministry, or, you know, if there's something we can pray for you about or a spiritual question that we can answer, I want to encourage you to go to our website at svbcfamily.com. That's for Shenandoah Valley Baptist Church family.com. And just follow the prompts there. And you can send your prayer request. You can send your question and everything. We'll get back to you as soon as possible. But as always, you're welcome to join us any Sunday at 1030 a.m., right here in uh, Stephen City, located right between Route 11 and I-81. So uh, come and see us sometime, but until then, I pray the Lord bless you, I pray the Lord keep you, and that the Lord shine His face upon you.